Hey, this is the Level Up Engineering Podcast, where we talk with some of the most successful engineering leaders who reveal actionable management insights that help you take your developer team to the next level. This episode is brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications from design to delivery with React, Node.js, and Angular. Check them out at CodingSans.com. Welcome to the Level Up Engineering Podcast. I am Carolina Toth, and I have John Ford here with me today. Um, the Level Up Engineering Podcast comes to you bi-weekly, and we always talk with accomplished tech leaders. If you follow us, you have heard John speak about turning around underachieving teams before. He is the Hungarian country leader of Log Me In, and he's also the VP of Engineering there. And he has an impressive track record, which I'm not going to go into any further. You can uh, listen to our previous conversation and um, get a lot of tips about um, coming into a team and turning it around. Um, today, I have John here to talk about the State of Software Development 2021 report, uh, which I have here with me um, and you also have. And our listeners can download it uh, from the show description so if you have not seen the report um you should feel free to click on the link below and download it but um, our conversation should be followable even if you don't have the report in front of me and please if you're driving do not look at your screen uh, with that said welcome john uh, please tell us a bit about yourself and also what your passions are hi so firstly thanks very much for having me back uh, it's great to talk to you again um, yeah, so like you said, I'm VP of Engineering for the remote support group of our products at Log Me In. So it's a global team uh, across several countries, and I'm also the country lead for Log Me In in Hungary. Um, and now we're spread all over the country. So you know, we're not just in Budapest; we're in multiple, multiple lo locations. People have taken the opportunity to kind of move into uh, a bigger house, and uh, you know, maybe make the most of the situation that the pandemic has presented to us. And yeah, so I've been working in software for over 25 years now, um, various different companies. And it was very interesting, the report that came out that you put together. I think generally it resonated pretty closely with what we've been finding over the last year at Log Me In. And we can talk about more details, obviously, during this conversation. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so with that said, um, this report has five parts in it. Um, we, we cover a lot of things and uh, let me just uh, kind of go through um, the, the nitty gritty. We, we have um, management related trends and challenges and we have technology and tool focus, um, which we are probably not going to talk about all that much um, we also have hiring and we have outsourcing and finally we talk a lot about performance management in the report um, so if you haven't seen it terrorist listeners or watchers um, you should download it it's free um, and with that said what was your most interesting finding of the report what did you what did you find yeah, awesome. so um, there were the the things I found quite interesting, um, and I guess it's because I'm in senior management now. Were where there were major differences between the developers' perceptions and the managers' perceptions. So to give you an idea, and just to show that I read the whole report on page <laughs> forty three. <laughs> um, we had um, quite a large difference on. Uh, the perceived number one cause of delivery problems as being estimation. And uh, developers, 18% of developers thought this and only 9% of managers. And I was quite surprised because I would have expected it to be the other way around. I would have expected managers to think that the developers weren't, uh, were either underestimating or over overestimating. So either like sandbagging or, um, you know, uh, unaware of potentially the complexity of the work involved. 
So that was quite a big one. And then on a similar note, there was also a kind of 2x difference on uh, page nine. So the biggest challenge um, was stated as sharing knowledge by twice as many developers, 27%, as managers, 12%. And again, I would have expected it to be the other way around because as managers, we're always trying to like share the knowledge in the team, cross-pollinate good practice. And I just assume that devs know where to go. You know, they have their common Jira instance and they're working off the same backlog. But it would appear from, you know, the feedback in the report that that's not necessarily the case. Right, right. And that can be applied to not just, I think not just project related things, but also um, in general, keeping up with the trends and making sure that uh, perhaps new kind of company resources are communicated and and people can really be up to date in their lives as developers or yeah and there's a challenge there with everyone working remotely so you know it's a bit harder to get around people you can't just swing by someone's desk and have a kind of open office conversation that other people can chime in if they you know if they're interested so yeah. um how did you how did you get around that i've been um we've been um in kind of pandemic mode for over a year now and um and i've been talking to leaders on the show and um just in my life in general and um and a lot of people have mentioned that it's been a challenge to them uh to kind of keep the the company spirits up and and make sure that information is spread properly across the board um we also have some statistics about that in the report but um i'm interested in your kind of practices yeah, so maybe uh, just you mentioned the report, and I thought there were some quite interesting statistics there. So, for example, something that really struck me was more than three quarters of respondents said that they had implemented remote work because of COVID, so since COVID. Whereas right. in my 25 years, I've always worked at least partly remotely. And you know, this was even in the time of like a 128 KPS dial-up modem, you know, in 25 years ago. So now I think I just assumed that software engineers always worked at least a day or two a week remotely. But it seems from the report, I mean, 76% said that they'd implemented it because after the pandemic hit. So that was a surprise. And I think um, it's kind of... For engineers, it's not necessarily a bad thing that they can sit and concentrate on their own without being interrupted. They can get into the zone, they can concentrate, they need to really focus on uh, on some of the uh, problems that need to be um, either fixed or you know some of the code that needs to be created. So I can see that for a, a lot of people, I mean, engineers are often relatively introverted. <laughs> So being able to focus without your team leader or your manager coming by and asking, hey, how are you, which could be very distracting, then, you know, I think that's probably a good thing. And I noticed that about 25% of people said that it, the pandemic did have a positive effect working remotely. But then, of course, we're all different. We're all engineers. We all are sociable beings. We like, you know, having coffees and lunches. We don't like being disturbed from our work. But, you know, when we have a break, we do. We don't necessarily want to have a break on our own, you know. And that's kind of um, what I've been missing, and I think quite a few people at uh, at Log Me In as well, to be honest. And you know, that was backed up by the report as well. Sort of twenty five percent again roughly. Um, so what we've tried to do is kind of recreate some of those moments. So we've tried to, you know, have regular touch bases, obviously all over GoToMeeting and using our own remote tools that we create. We've also tried to uh, create some kind of lighthearted moments because we found that um, it, in general, people have too many meetings and the meetings are kind of very serious they're all work related you know 
So we've in, we've had uh, we've run a couple of quiz nights. Um, we've kept um, kind of breakout team sizes to about 10, 12 people so that everyone can contribute. Um, we recently, for one team, um, ordered uh, salad boxes with dips and got them sent to people's homes so that we had a team meeting and everyone could like share their salad together. Um, we've had a few kind of lighthearted things. Um, and then what I've also tried to do is be cognizant of people's time. So instead of fixing up, you know, multiple, multiple Outlook calendar invites to yet another video conference, um, I've tried to kind of maybe group a few people together, um, reach out to new joiners, for example. We've grown quite a lot during COVID times, so we've had quite a few people join who have never met um, their colleagues. So try and reach out to them. And then I guess the other thing we did um, was just kind of have a two or three times a week, have a sort of open hour, uh, like a coffee time at the beginning of the day where people, everyone was invited, completely optional. Um, people could just drop in. And I guess the only condition was that you don't talk about work. You know, you can talk about <laughs> what you did at the weekend, what music you're listening to, um, what your children are up to these days. Uh, and it was just a kind of 15, 20 minute chat. And what I found was, you know, you invite 500 people and it's probably more or less the same 10 or 20 that turn up nice regularly. One. So the people who really needed that kind of social interaction had the channel um, to join and chat if they wanted. Right, right. And I'm sure a lot of people who live with their families or, or live with maybe even housemates or, or anything of the sort, they were happy when they could get some alone time so they wouldn't join the company chat. But it's it's good that some people had that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, And actually, Carolina, just on that point, if anyone gets interrupted by their children, Uh, one thing I always do is encourage them to sit their child on their lap and we have a little chat and we say, hello, what's your name? And, you know, so if it's like a seven-year-old girl um, in um, in the Midwest of America, I was saying, you know, I'm talking to you from Hungary. Do you know where that is? So just try and engage a little bit so that they don't feel that um, they're dad is being taken away from them by constantly talking on the screen. So just kind of recognizing the human situation that people are in. You know? That's really sweet. And yeah, and <laughs> teaching children that it's okay to just be. Um, that's, that's really awesome. So we touched on um, some of some of these, um, some of these stats. And you mentioned um, remote work being implemented because of COVID, which was a, an interesting statistic that you found. And um, I my immediate thought was that perhaps um, remote work was allowed before, but since it wasn't encouraged as much, well, it, there is nothing better of an encouragement than a global pandemic. Uh, but since it wasn't, you know, like mandatory for everyone all the time, uh, maybe the tools weren't thought out quite as well and and uh, things weren't made as comfortable to do from home so for example you know uh, when you had to hold a workshop you could always all just go into the office and make sure that um, everybody is there in person and now everybody having to stay at home all these challenges were had to were, all these challenges had to be concurred Yeah, I, I think the impact, really, the long-lasting impact is it has accelerated the digital transformation. So COVID has acted as a catalyst. It's really accelerated the move to being able to work from anywhere, basically, which was already there, but people maybe didn't realize it. Uh, some of the fine-tuning hadn't happened because we are very dependent on, you know, having a stable network connection and the right tools in place, etc. 
But to give you an example, uh, yesterday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a doctor, and he is basically a counsellor for cognitively impaired people um, in Greater London. So many of his patients are older, you know, maybe slightly senile. And um, he realised that instead of travelling into, into London every day, um, obviously, because of COVID, he was having to do any all his counselling sessions online. And um, over the last year, he's realised that actually it's perfectly possible. He can do that. His patients, most of them already know him, so they open up. Uh, they can express each other. And he's, he's just saving time every day uh, from the morning commute, the, the daily commute there and back. So I think the long-term impact for even that's a kind of people-focused profession, but even for something like you know medical counselling, you can do it online. We have the tools, we have the capability, and COVID has just accelerated that recognition and that transition um, to having the choice of working remotely. Right, right. Um, it, to, even to me, it kind of seems like uh, how... how amazing it was for me to to commute about almost two hours every day and um, and go into an office when I can do most of the things I do from the comfort of my home um, yeah and I'm interested um, in your opinion you mentioned that you at least partially always worked um, remotely and Um, how how did your your life change and your positions um, responsibilities kind of form throughout the pandemic yeah that's an interesting question so I had only joined the company about a month before in fact covid was in its early days uh, as I joined uh, begin in q1 last year 2020. So in terms of getting to know colleagues, meeting them, um, I kind of missed out on that, which uh, going back to the example of my doctor friend, he already knew most of his patients so they could trust him, etc. So um, I think some of the communication needs to be quite clear. The expectations you're setting, uh, we've moved um, deliberately towards a kind of writing culture. where we're documenting stuff and sharing the documents so that people can add to them asynchronously, comment on them so that it's kind of clear so that we can collaborate in a clear way. And we've made a conscious decision to implement this culture at Log me in just so that uh, you're not misunderstanding each other. you know because most people, I think most people act out of good intentions, but a lot of our body language, a lot of the tone of voice, you can't necessarily tell if you're remote. Um, I think, uh, so I mentioned how for software engineering, it's good to be able to focus, get in the zone, et cetera. Um, however, there are certain things which really are easier to do in person. So uh, we're, we're bringing out some pretty innovative new products In log me in and kind of brainstorming what the functionality should be how we create them what the architecture should be that kind of close collaboration between product management user experience software engineering sometimes sales and marketing you know having a an in-person workshop would be a lot easier that way um, however even after covid we're still going to work in this remote centric way and So you know with we're, we're, we're going to manage the amount of uh, in-person time that we have. And it was quite interesting looking through the report on some of the tools that uh, you know other software development teams are using. And in general, you know we're using Bitbucket, Jira. Um, for these kind of product um, ideation and then uh, I guess management, Um, uh, requirements. We're also using things like Miro boards where you can drag and drop. It's very visual. Um, but yeah, on the whole, the tools are there. So 
um, we've we've tried, you know, we're still learning. We're continuously going to be learning how to be most effective in this way. We're working across time zones. I'm working with teams, obviously, in America, Canada, India, as well as Europe. So, yeah, I think we're all learning, but right. But it's possible. And, you know, needless to say, we've driven out productivity. So we've tried to encourage people to manage their work-life balance. But the fact is, you know, you have several hours more in the day. Um, and, you know, we've seen productivity increase. Uh, as leaders and managers, we've had to sometimes push quite hard for people to not overdo it. So make sure that you take time off, you take your holidays, We've instituted uh, once a month a self-care day for the whole company globally so that nobody works on the first Friday of the month. No Slack, no email, no meetings, nothing. Just take a day off and you won't have anything to catch up on when you come back. So how this awesome. is, uh, yeah, this is to make sure that people are looking after their mental health. Um, thank you for sharing that. Maybe some listeners can be inspired um, by that by that self-care day um, lots of uh, interesting things you mentioned I want to kind of touch on the fact that you mentioned that you grew in the pandemic which is which is pretty great um, and you also mentioned that you're working on some some new things within the company um, in the report 22% Uh, of or respondents um, said that um, the pandemic impacted their company more positively than negatively. Um, if you could elaborate a little bit uh, on, the, if you can, on the the new things that you're working on and and how or which parts of the company grew in your case. Yeah. So um, I mean, Log Me In makes uh, tools to. Um, empower the remote workforce. So basically for connecting securely and supporting remote workers. So this is, um, the, the pandemic has led to, you know, record results in terms of, uh, in commercial terms for the company. And so there's a kind of bittersweet thing. Obviously it's been a global tragedy, but for operators who are specifically Uh, creating the software or the tools in that space, obviously we've done very well. Um, we are constantly evolving as a company. And uh, one thing we are doing is uh, um, kind of looking to standardize and consolidate our portfolio. So we have a lot of different brands, many, many different brands, and uh, lots of different tech stacks. We've grown um, not not only organically, but we've also grown through mergers and acquisitions. So there's a lot of background work that needs to be done, usually technical work by the engineering teams to get these various solutions to work together. So um, to link up identity systems, to ensure that entitlement and authorizations are the flow, the process flow is smooth, um, link these to e-commerce systems so that we can so that our customers can buy and commission online and uh, have the right uh, authorizations to use the tools that they bought. Uh, it's obvious, but you know, there's a lot of back, back end plumbing required. But also our key differentiator in the market for Log Me In is exactly the fact that we're offering a portfolio of products. So although we make GoToMeeting, we aren't just a competitor of Zoom because we also have GoTo as essentially a replacement for your mobile app and your PBX switches. And we can lay LastPass on top of that, which enables secure password management and secure access and identity management uh, using MFA. We can offer that for enterprises, channel partners. And on top of that, we can offer the remote support tools like Rescue, um, GoToAssist, so that if there's any issues um, with your remote workforce, then someone can support them remotely. So putting all these options together makes us kind of, uh, gives us a much broader portfolio of remote working solutions than what Zoom can offer, for example. Uh, however, you know, there's a lot of work 
um, ongoing to kind of get everything to work seamlessly in the background so that our customers can take advantage of commissioning new areas of the portfolio, adding stuff. Uh, technology is changing as well. So, you know, we need to make sure we, we stay at the cutting edge of uh, media server design, for example, to make sure there's no lag when we're supporting a client. And when you're sharing screens or co-browsing together, you know, that's a lot of packets of data being shared backwards and forwards at the same time. So we need to make sure that uh, we're right right on the, the edge there. So there's, there's a lot going on, definitely, a lot. <laughs> right. That sounds exciting. Um, and, and, and sounds like a lot of fun, to be honest. It's, uh, it's always fun to create new things. Um, I, and since we talked about growth, um, I wanted to share that, um, employee referral has, has always been, um, the, the highest in, getting new developers within our respondents. And um, I am just interested in how you um, reach out to new colleagues, how you hire talent, what are some of your favorite channels to, to get to new um, future colleagues? Yeah. So there was quite a lot in the report about hiring and... Um, I think, although I might be slightly biased, but I think there's basically not enough software developers in the whole world. So I think there are multiple reasons for this, probably because, you know, the education systems are playing catch up a little bit, you know, and whether that's in France, the UK, the US or other countries, you know, um, we're asking a lot of our teachers to stay on top of everything. And probably by the time um, a child has kind of gone through the education system, the technology landscape has completely changed anyway. So you have to be self-educated and self-driven really to keep growing on the engineering, uh, in the engineering profession. Um, I'm not sure I would put that as our top challenge though. So LogMeIn has a, a great brand, is very well known um, in Hungary and, and other places where we have development centers. So referrals and applications as well have always played a big part. We have a very active referral scheme. It's probably about 25% of our candidates, maybe more, um, come from referrals. It's like a shortcut to vetting people as well because you're only going to refer someone who you actually want to work with. Right. Um, all those other people, for whatever reason, are, are not going to get your recommendation. So you almost know um, at the first step, first hurdle, that you're dealing with someone who's who's okay, you know, who, who doesn't need to be vetted too stringently. Um, we, we also have in-house recruiting teams and they're fairly proactive, you know, and uh, I would say we have quite stringent requirements. So we're looking, we are looking first and foremost for great technical talent you know, um, the soft skills take a, a back seat compared to really being excellent at engineering or user experience or, you know, whatever field you're in. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the languages and the areas that people are recruiting for, it's pretty much the same for us. You know, JavaScript, Java, C++, bit of PHP, uh, kind of the usual, the usual languages. It was interesting to see that Java is maybe dropping off a little bit versus 2020 and 2019. JavaScript is right up there still, and I guess that's a very, very popular skill. But probably between you know proactive um, recruitment on behalf of our talent acquisition team and referrals, and then also applicants coming because they know the name of Log Me In and we have a good brand on the local market. I would say that covers most of our recruitment without too much difficulty. Right. And you mentioned that's not your biggest challenge. Would you care to share what your biggest challenge is? So I think what I mentioned about bringing all the products together, the integrate, so integration is always really hard. And uh -huh. particularly when you have products at different stages of their maturity, 
you know, some of them are, they're not legacy, but, you know, they've been around for a while. They're still bringing in a significant revenue stream um, and kind of motivating teams by assuring them that this product, although it's 10 years old, is just as important, if not more important than this flashy new product, because it's actually earning us money. And without the money, the revenue stream delivered by this product, we can't actually build the new product. So, right. So, and then getting them both to work together, building feature parity in the new product so that eventually we'll be able to migrate over users from the, the older product and consolidate on a new platform, a unified integrated platform. And then doing that across, you know, two or three um, use case domains. These are the kind of the main challenges for us at the moment. Wow. And doing that in an efficient way. So we're also bringing together engineering teams across a large function, um, improving processes, bringing, you know, process innovation. Uh, the, these are the kind of challenges that are really um, probably top of mind for us. Right, right. And lots of lots of really exciting things there or well i like work so probably exciting for me um and to me that sounds a lot like you have to motivate your developers in in many different ways when it comes to the variety of your products and and working on those products and working on different areas and improving processes um and i also uh, heard that keeping people motivated has also been a challenge in this pandemic and in this past year. Uh, and it's always a challenge, but now we have seen different challenges in motivation. Um, what are your thoughts on that? How do you keep colleagues motivated? How do you keep yourself motivated? Yeah, so I think there's a few things. And I guess it kind of came out in the report as well. So um, giving people a level of autonomy or empowerment. So basically trusting them to be able to do their job is important, you know, without breathing down their neck and kind of telling them what to do. Or, you know, if you ask, if you give someone a, a task or you ask them to do something, then you know, don't quickly do it for them 10 minutes later, but leave them to do it, delegate it, trust them. Um, otherwise, don't ask them to do it if you're just going to quickly rush and do it yourself. So, you know, there's this level of empowerment, um, which in a remote setting probably requires more trust, you know, because honestly, you don't know whether someone is, you know, uh, taking their kids to nursery school or sitting down doing what you ask them to do, you know, but you need to kind of trust them to deliver and then measure the deliverables and measure what happens after a given period of time, you know, so have that um, performance me measurement system in place, those metrics. Um, I think as well, so I mentioned something about working on new stuff or I guess it's more appreciating what people are doing and rewarding them. So we've recently put in place a new reward scheme where people, other employees can um, award points uh, to colleagues in any team. And uh, if you collect enough points, you can uh, transfer them into prizes and actually buy something. But you can also just... Uh, give kudos awards to people without any points. So, you know, you can just recognize fellow workers for stuff they're doing. And um, I guess there's a kind of internal growth or constant development mechanism that we have implemented in Log Me In, where even if so, software engineers like to learn new stuff. Right. And it doesn't necessarily need to be. Uh, new technology, it could just be new things for them. So you could have someone working on a Java tech stack who they've been doing it for four or five years and they want to get into something else. And we and we did this with uh, uh, one woman and moved them into a kind of more a C++ product stack. Uh, 
um, internally. So this internal mobility is important to us to kind of keep growing people between teams. Um, so these kind of things. I think, you know, empowerment, uh, growth, personal growth, keep growing is one of our four key values. And then I do believe as well, but I might be a bit idealistic in this, that people like to have a, a purpose. So they like to be working to basically improve the world. And um, as we mentioned earlier, during this COVID pandemic, Log Me In has certainly found its purpose because we are enabling our customers and our customer base to stay productive and keep working and keep supporting their users and their customers even during this uh, pandemic time. So we found our purpose and we need to communicate that to our people. Uh, but I think it's quite motivating, at right. least for me. Right. <laughs> okay. But well, I think that makes sense of making the world a better place. Uh, and one way that it, that you can do that is through your work. So we spend a lot of time at work anyway. So it's it's really great if you can find the, the greater meaning in that. Um, and you mentioned uh, mentioned the company values and forty point seventy eight percent of our respondents said that willingness to learn is the the top criteria for for their people. Um, this went up um, from from two thousand and eighteen, and I am. Um, curious and you also mentioned you know like growing all the time and and um, staying staying on top of like personal personal motivation and personal growth is very important mm. could you give us some tips as to how you can find that in your in your new hires and and um, what perhaps our listeners can do to also find that in their new hires yeah so um it was interesting this stat i thought because it didn't it kind of half resonated so i think continuous improvement is almost like table stakes if you want to maintain your value in the technology sector and bearing in mind that nowadays Basically, every company is a technology company because if it isn't, then it's probably not going to be a company for much longer. <laughs> then you need to keep improving and you need to be curious. You need to be finding and reading stuff on, on the internet or in books. Um, if, a, if a colleague recommends a good book to me, then I will usually go and get it and make sure that I'm not missing out on anything, you know, so... Um, there's a lot of good stuff out there that you can keep growing. Um, I think two of our other values are probably equally as important, especially to our product technology group. So to our software engineering teams, our product development teams, and they are move fast and think big. Mm -hmm. So we've got to like keep moving quickly, making decisions quickly, removing barriers to decision making ensuring you know that um, we don't have delay or procrastination because the market doesn't wait you know so we've got to take opportunities and some of those opportunities are really good so at the moment the potential for log me in is is huge and bearing in mind that you know we've just posted we've we've posted two or three record years in a row so we're growing and growing uh, but now as the world accelerates towards remote work, is really our opportunity. So I mentioned some of the, the new platforms that we're building, some of the um, integrated uh, next generation remote support platforms, which are basically going to um, take the place of a dozen products that are in our remote support area. Um, and that's kind of thinking big. So we've really put our hats on of, okay, how to build a conversational NLP-driven ticketing interface or how to, you know, um, consolidate the features uh, from these dozen products into one, one product. And this think big and moving fast is probably at least as important as keep growing. And if, if you deliver that, 
you will keep growing as well on a technical level. <laughs> I, it's, I can guarantee it. <laughs> it's all interconnected. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's that's really awesome. And I I have some questions here about performance management. It's it's always a tricky subject, it seems, um, for for my guests and myself as well. Um, some of the top metrics were um, having working software and and completed tasks. And uh, what's interesting is that almost twenty two percent of our respondents don't use any metrics to measure developer performance. How do you measure performance? Do you measure performance? Um, and if so, uh, what do you think is best? So yeah, we definitely measure performance. Um, I think there's a, so there's a there's an art and a science. Uh, or to put it another way, there's usually a story behind any set of metrics. You know, so um, engineers are very very smart people, and uh, they definitely know how to play any system that's out there <laughs> so it needs to be a kind of objective almost like when you do a post-mortem you just you just look at what happened during the timeline of an incident you're not blaming anyone so we want to measure like objective statistics around resource allocation um, delivery velocity sprint velocity uh, also something around predictability, you know, and here um, I've said to people, I don't want 100% predictability because if you're always delivering 100% of what you said you were going to do in your estimation, then it either it shows that um, you're not pushing yourself enough, so the targets are not challenging enough, or it shows that uh, you and the team are just very, very good at estimating, you know. Whereas actually, we need you to be very productive and very good at delivering software. Obviously, working software is the real um, measure of success. And by working, I would also throw in quality metrics like um, high severity incidents after release. I wouldn't so much measure bugs or defects because, again, anyone can code in loads and loads of defects to drive their count up and then drive it down depending what the um, what the manager is asking for. Uh, so what I would want to look at is high severity defects in production and obviously a downward trend. Rework, uh, rework needs to be zero or as close to zero. And we also look at security um, stronger and stronger. So security is now even more important than it was uh, with everyone working remotely. Um, we took some lessons from the SolarWinds hack. Uh, we've tightened up our security processes. Also on the metrics side, um, I think there are two dimensions to reporting. There's like upwards reporting and sort of downwards, how you measure the team, how you run the team, how you operate. And of course, depending on the level of the, the manager or the team leader or uh, the scrum master or, you know, that kind of operational metrics gets into more and more detail depending how close you get to the work, you know. Um, and I guess the opposite is true, that depending how far up you're reporting, the aggregation of the sample set becomes higher and higher and more general. You know, so at the top level, there's probably reporting to the board of directors where it's an aggregate across, I don't know, 2,000 engineers and, you know, what are these guys working on? And that's kind of depends how much detail you want to go into, but it's a, a, a super high aggregation. Um, so what we've done is we've implemented, definitely implemented dashboards at a team level where each team can see how their performance is doing with direct links to the Jira ticket, the Jira issue, or the Bitbucket pull request, or whatever. Um, but those are not necessarily what we would aggregate all the way up, because sometimes the gulf is pretty huge between what the board want to see and uh, you know what the individual engineers are working on. Yeah, and uh, just a, a question in there. 
do you um is this like transparent to the entire company is what i'm trying to ask like do teams see each other's boards not necessarily so they can be they might not be interested to be honest so uh, at a team level at an engineering team level yes we can make them transparent and yes they are would you be interested i don't know the tech stacks are different like i said there's often a story behind each metric you know why is one team releasing practically every day whereas the other team is releasing kind of once every two weeks well it's probably because their tech stack doesn't allow such a flexible agile approach it could be because the product is much more mature and there aren't so many new features being requested by our customers because they've been using it for a long time the other one might have just been coming out of mvp stage and is really running to get to feature parity with a competitor product you know there's always a story behind uh the metrics um what i would say at the board level is that often they will be looking at uh kind of pulling in non-engineering metrics as well so they might be looking at um attrition levels or the efficiency of a team um which attrition levels would pull in kind of hr metrics that hr are tracking for all people in the company and maybe focusing on one group such as engineering or efficiency you would have to pull in um fte cost uh which again i guess is a either a financial or an hr statistic you'd probably have to bring in sales statistics like the revenue generated by the team so get the revenue divided by the headcount cost to find the efficiency and none of those are really strictly speaking engineering metrics right you know? right and i think i'm kind of uh starting to grasp what you meant um with the different levels of the of the performance management or measurement um and to me it sounds like it's always context dependent but there is different kind of contexts in which it can be dependent so it's like for the teams it, you mentioned a different kind of tax tax so it's it's different um even um deployment rate is different for different teams and as you move up higher in the organization of course your performance metrics are going to be different because you have different kinds of tasks and um different kinds of things to to accomplish and then even within the different levels of the of the organization there are kind of different goals to which yeah. you have to different stakeholders achieve. different yeah. interests different th- different questions they want answered yeah so, so to our, think, yeah well i was going to say i think it's key like there's a lean concept that um it's it's take a systems view and of take a holistic systems view of things and people generally want the best want to do their best work So if something is kind of broken or stuck it's probably a process issue rather than a people issue you know because actually rubbish processes are really demotivating for people so right. if you can fix the process you will probably reengage the um the people anyway so right um and to our listeners i think that means um that you have to know your own organization and your own goals um to be able to kind of create performance measurement that is really about your company and and really about the value that you're trying to bring to the world and not just some performance management guides kind of pointer that you implemented because you read somewhere that it's good um We are almost out of time here. Um I I wanted to ask you just one last question about um outsourcing. Um almost half of our respondents said 41% said that they have outsourced software development in the past 12 months, uh, which is basically the entirety of the pandemic. Um how do you see outsourcing um and and has it changed over over the past year yeah so um 
we do a limited amount of um, using contractors, um, but basically, I mean, they're partners. So my when I read this part of the report, I immediately thought, no, we don't outsource. We're a software development company. We do it all ourselves. And then I thought, no, actually, you know, there there has been some very nitty gritty um, work, uh, specifically integrating uh, the identity systems of a couple of these older products, which um, we don't particularly need those skills in the long term in the company. It's not necessarily something that we want our people to be learning how to do. I don't think it would be particularly motivating for people to work on that stuff. I mean, obviously, we need to oversee the contractors, provide some knowledge and some context and background anyway. Um, and we needed to move fast. So one of our you know, values, like I said, is move fast, and we needed this done very quickly. So for about six months of um, this past year, um, we have been using a, a contractor team. Um, software, they are purely software. So it's not, you know, one of the big consultancy companies. And it's gone pretty well, you know, so we chose uh, roughly the same time zone as um, the rest of the team. So within an hour or two, um, we have very regular meetings, probably daily, daily stand up. And it's gone pretty well. And I have to say, probably as a stretch resource to get this thing done, in a short space of time, um, and the cost hasn't been prohibitive either. So I think it was definitely the right approach. And it's something that I would definitely uh, look at most of the time, the opportunity to use contractors. Yes, thank you. Um, we have discussed a lot of uh, topics within the State of Software Development Report. I am encouraging our listeners to download the report from the show's description. And um, I would like to ask you if there is anything else that you would like to add. No, I don't think so. We covered, I think we covered all the five areas. And uh, it's been great talking to you again. Thanks very much for the opportunity to share some of what we're doing at Log Me In. Thank um, you. Uh, Thank yeah, you. It's been good. Um, and um, to our listeners, would you care to share where they can follow your work? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. Also Twitter. I have a Twitter handle, um, which should be quite easy to find. Um, Ford739564. Uh, you probably wouldn't have guessed that. But... And what um, is there a meaning to it? It was an old telephone number I had in the UK. And I thought, I'm not just going to use my age or my date of birth because that's too obvious. So obvious. Yeah. How awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right. Um, then I guess oh, th this is the end of our conversation. Um, I think we really touched on a lot of things. Hiring, COVID, performance management, tools. Uh, thank you for coming on the show, dearest listeners. Today, again, my guest was John Ford, VP of Engineering for, at LogMeIn and also country leader at LogMeIn. Um, make sure to follow him on Twitter or LinkedIn and um, make sure to follow Level Up Engineering on Twitter. And thank you for tuning in to the podcast. I am Carolina Toth and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for staying with Level Up Engineering. If you enjoyed this podcast, so will your friends. Share this episode on your favorite social networking platform. To stay up to date with our content, follow Level Up Engineering on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or Google Podcast. Brought to you by Coding Sans, a software development agency building web applications with Angular and Node.js. Check them out at codingsans.com.